Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you all with us. Our goal with Founderline is to provide a forum where startup founders and employees can get their questions about startups answered. Um, maybe you're thinking about starting a company. Maybe you're a startup founder and you have some questions about a situation that's going on at your company. Uh, maybe you're an employee who's thinking about joining a startup. And in any of those cases, uh, if you have a question, we'd like to try and help you out. Uh, this is a live show. So uh, you can reach out to us th multiple ways. Uh, you can call us toll free. The number is 1-844-4-FOUNDER. That's 1-844-436-8633. You can email us. The email address is help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet at us. The Twitter handle is at Founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is John Lilly, who's a partner at Greylock Partners. John's been an entrepreneur and an investor um, in many different companies. He's worked at Apple, Trilogy, and Reactivity, a company he founded. He's also uh, been an investor in some great companies, Dropbox, Tumblr, and Instagram, as well as many others. John, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joe. I've never heard of an 844 number before. Like moving down in the 12 feet exactly. Well, you know, when you want to get a vanity number, you got to like... You, you got to dig you, deep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good work. So, it, it turns out there are actually people who will rent you out numbers and then over time raise the prices on you. So yeah, very, very interesting thing. Smart. Things. At, you know, as in a startup, you got to find these things out. So, two, it's uh, probably two Y Combinator companies doing that right now. Exactly. And, and they'll be at Demo Day shortly. So... Um, so usually when, uh, when we start out, I like to ask a few questions just to, you know, let people get to know you a little bit better sure. and, um, and talk about some, some hopefully interesting topics. So, you know, you and I have known each other a long time now. Um, you've been working in startups for almost 20 years now, right? Probably more than 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're old. Um, <laughs> and, and I think one of the things that's been really interesting is how, the funding and creation of startups has really evolved, especially in the last, say, five to seven years. Sure. Um, you know, th think back to your days at Reactivity and like what you went through there, as well as what's going on now. So, wa walk us through, you know, what you've seen and and uh, the changes you've seen uh, as you've been working in startups. Sure. Well, I think it's hard. It's hard to remember now, but I think it was a pretty. It was pretty hard to figure out just what to do when you were getting funded before. Like, I don't know exactly how it was for you when you did when, when Reactivity, you know, I remember our first meeting with a VC and VCs were kind of this like mysterious thing and we went in and we had no idea what to expect and we met, Ann, it turned out to be Ann Winblad at Hummer Winblad, was my, the first VC I ever really met. And we just had no idea how to approach it, no idea how to talk to her. And we never really, we couldn't really even figure, we were so young and kind of dumb, but we, we just didn't even, we didn't even know how to ask anybody about how to talk to her. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, we, we lucked out and we ended up taking uh, an investment from a guy named Peter Fenton, who was an associate at uh, Excel at the time, and, his, and the partner there was a guy named Mitch Kapoor. But the reason we knew Peter is because we knew him from school. And, you know, it's just <laughs> was so hard to get access and so hard to understand back in 1997, 1998. Now, I think, you know, you, you walk outside, you fall over an angel investor or a micro VC or, you know, venture capitalist on Twitter. And uh, I think the access is much, much clearer. I think um, the sense of how to approach it, how to talk to people is much clearer. Um, Lots and more I, resources online for, for people sure. to read about it and hear stories about yeah. it, right? Yeah, for sure. So I think I think a lot of that's changed. I think, and, and of course, the other thing that's changed is that the capital requirements have been completely different. You know, every time we you know we started a lot of companies out of reactivity, but you, know, you have to go get a. We actually had a server room in our in our shitty little office, right? Yeah. And uh, wow, I already swore it took me two yeah. minutes. We'll, and I, we'll charge you later. Don't worry. It's, uh, I knew it would happen. I didn't think the first two minutes. Anyway, so, um, but we had server rooms and servers and racks. And of course now AWS, you can get started and, and get in distribution, you know, right away. So yeah, I think everything's changed, which is why you're seeing this explosion of creativity now. No, I, and it's, it's awesome, right? It's, it's just, it uh, is. it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's good for everyone really. for yeah. of startups. So yep. that's great. Um, so, you know, as I was, um, doing a little homework on this, um, you know, the two that stood out for me were some recent ex exits, Tumblr and Instagram. And um, I, I think I think what's interesting is, you know, ev everybody knows about these companies and maybe was a user or had heard about them, but, but getting access to them and being able to convince them to take money from you is a different story, right? Yeah. And so, 
Um, I don't want you to give away any of your like VC secrets, you know, that uh, that that you don't want your competitors to know. But um, walk, walk us through um, the process of identifying those companies that you know you want to spend more time with, and then ultimately getting the investment from them. Yeah. Well, I mean, Tumblr is a fun one. You know, we invested in that in the first year, my first year as a VC, which was uh, 2011. And, uh, you know, that came in through my partner, David. Uh, David Z, uh, my partner who invested in LinkedIn, Facebook, Pandora. Yeah. He's, he's been very, very successful VC. And one of the special things about Greylock is that, you know, David, David had known Bijan Sabat, who's a, a, an amazing and great investor as well. He had known him along the, on the way and just said, hey, you know, next, when, whenever Tumble raises, give me a shout. And then David, uh, you know, got me involved. We flew to New York. We, you know, we spent a lot of time with David Karp. Um, and the two and, of you. Yeah, David, David Z and I did okay. together. I think some firms, you know, the senior partner goes and tries to do the, you know, tries to get the interesting deal. I think David was always very, very supportive and really worked hard to make sure that I had the chance to interact with da with David Carp, the founder of Tumblr, and John Malo John Maloney, the CEO, the CEO, the president. And uh, you know, mostly we just we liked the product, we used it, and we went and we talked to Tumblr about it. We said, "Oh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Tell us what you're doing next." And I think the first day we spent probably two or three hours just talking about product. Hmm. I don't think we talked about the investment or the funding at all. And so we spent two or three hours with David. Uh, I went back to New York a few weeks later just to see him again and talk him through product and talk him through what, what they were planning to do with the business. And for me, th that's, the e that's the fun thing to do because I'm, you know, I've, I've, I was involved in startups for 20 years before I, did, before I uh, became an investor. I just like talking about product, how you're building the business, how you're staffing, how you're, how you're you know, built, you get attracting the best possible people for every role, hmm. what the challenges are. And uh, we, we just did that a lot with David, with David and John uh, for over the course of three or four meetings. And then we were aggressive. We, we ended up investing in Tumblr without bringing them into the partnership, which in, and I found out in retrospect, it was our largest check we'd ever written into a company in the f for the first round. Wow, was it so, because it was competitive and there was a clock, or what, what was the? Uh, yeah, I think so. It was a competitive deal. We were interested in being involved, and uh, we uh, so we, we did what we could to do it. And so that was it was scarier in retrospect than I, it should have been scarier than I felt. I felt a little scary, but it, once he once he told me it was the biggest check, check we'd ever written for the first round, <laughs> yeah, it no, pressure. A little scarier. no pressure, no pressure. At all. But anyway, this, that was uh, we, I felt very lucky to be involved in that company, and uh, obviously uh, they're doing very very well at uh, Yahoo now. Yeah, Instagram's different. You know, Instagram I. Can't came to from a product standpoint and I just started using the product and my aha there was I was having lunch with a photographer friend of mine, a guy named Eric Chang, who's now the, he runs photography at uh, DJI, they make those phantom drones. Okay. And so he, so Eric's claim to fame is that he, among his many claims to fame, is that he was one of the first underwater digital photographers. So he's huh. a semi-pro photographer, you know, amazing equipment, and what I noticed is that he started posting his pictures to Instagram using these filters that like would blow out the contrast or you know make them lower fidelity and I'm like Eric what are you doing like you have these beautiful pictures why why are you like a, an amazing photographer using Instagram yeah and he's like well I just I use it because I it because of distribution I use it because it's an easy and powerful way to to send what I what I take to lots and lots of people hmm. and that was that was the first time I really noticed and started paying attention to what's happening with Instagram as a distribution mechanism as opposed to just like a like a faux retro filter yep. company, you know, yep. and so then you know we call I, we called we called up Kevin and we started chasing Kevin and you know they were there were six or seven people at the time. He you know he's trying to figure out what what the hell he would do with financing. He's like he would raise six or seven million dollars from Benchmark. He had six or seven million uh, six or seven million users. They were growing like crazy. It's like what do I need more people for? Because everything's going great. And so uh, we chased him for six months and uh, eventually. Uh, Eventually, uh, it worked out, and we, you know, mostly the conversations we had were, well, let's let's help you think through what comes next. Let's help you think through how you hire, how you build an organization, how you yep. build an organization, not just a product, and how you build something that's really durable. And that sounds kind of ridiculous because you know we eventually uh, we eventually wrote the check. We wired the money on a Thursday, and he called me Sunday, that the next Sunday to tell me they were getting acquired by Facebook. So. So it was a four-day turn for us, which was uh, <laughs> unusual. So it's not exactly a dur build built to last, but um, but Kevin was so special, and he really had durability in his in his mind. He wanted to build a big, robust company, and so that was the, all the conversations we had over that six months. But it really took us probably six months to get to a place where he wow, was ready to get that's, funded. That's an awesome story. We'll we'll have to get him on here sometime and hear, Kevin's an hear entertaining from the guy. other side of the uh, you know the the aisle and uh, see what he says. Um, 
Well, that, that's great. Um, it, the other thing I thought would be interesting is I know you're on the board for Code for America. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's a really great uh, nonprofit and love to hear more about, you know, why you got involved in yeah. that and what they're up to and where they're heading. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know this. I, I believe in uh, in mixing for-profit work and nonprofit work. My work in Mozilla, which was a nonprofit for a long time. Sure. Um, I rolled off the board of that earlier this year, but a couple years a couple years ago, Jennifer Palka, the founder of Code for America, asked me to get involved. And her her basic thesis, she started the company, the organization, four or five years ago. It's a nonprofit, but her basic belief is that government can in the 21st century can work a government of the people and for the people, but that we have to figure out how to build engagement, how to get people involved, how to get technology built, and how to kind of match the you know the technology and the engagement of consumer technology to the government. Yep. And you know, I believe really strongly in that. It, that shows up as they have fellows that show up every year. They're designers and back-end technologists and front-end technologists. They go into the cities uh, that are partners of Code for America. They help them build engagement tools um, and more technology to get to social outcomes. And then they have brigades and an accelerator. And it's, it's really blossomed over the years into something pretty special. Awesome. Well, um, why don't we see if we can take some questions and yeah. help people out. Um, once again, if, um, if you want to reach us, call us. Uh, the number is 1-844-4-FOUNDER. Uh, email us, help at founderline.com, or tweet to at founderline. So let me see um, what's been coming in here. Oh, we got a, we got a call on hold. So let me, uh, on let me go over that. And telephone. it's, it's Hong. So um, we have Hong on the line. Uh, Hong, how you doing? Pretty good. Hey, uh, do you have do you have a question for us? Oh. Yeah, I do. So I'm a long time listener, multiple time caller. I usually ask more general questions about you know founder issues and, and uh, kind of how to relate to VCs, how to pitch to VCs. But in this case, I have a very specific question. Um, so there's a company that um, I'm working with, and they have a technology that uh, they want to kind of uh, share with the world, but there's no current um, customer for it, so they built a product to showcase the technology. And what the problem I'm seeing is, like, how do we pitch the company? Do we talk about the technology that's underlying it, or do we kind of use the product uh, as the initial kind of, um, I, I guess, do we talk more about the product or about the underlying technology, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I heard, I, I, I heard it a little bit. What, okay. I, what I heard you say is that you've got a company, they've got a technology, uh, no current customers, and so you're trying to figure out whether to showcase the technology or showcase sort of a product that you built around it to demonstrate the technology. And I think, I think it kind of depends. I think that, exactly. uh, you know, on today, in today's world, uh, you should be able to get to prospective customers of your technology. What we found, that's another thing that's so different than when, we, when you and I started up, is that, you know, at Greylock, we have huge companies come by and say, can, I, can we send our CIO, or our CTO, or our innovation teams by to talk to some of the innovative startups you have, hmm. whether they're in the portfolio or earlier. And so I think that more and more companies today are so thirsty for innovation and understanding how to apply and how to sort of translate what's happening in the consumer, uh, consumer world and the enterprise that they really go out of their way to talk to new and interesting startups. And I think mean, that's true in health industry. I think it's true in um, you know, big industries and big companies, manufacturing, everything, really. And so I think that um, if you have a technology, I think that it, it really depends on the nature of the technology, whether it's a, a, a fundamentally a consumer technology or fundamentally a, something that touches users or fundamentally something that more, more like it enables computer vision or you know, more of a broader use thing. And so I think that you really should try hard uh, to find actual people to talk to, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out of my way to create sort of uh, demonstration products around like it. Fake demos. And that yeah, I, I really think you have enough access mm. to enough people now uh, who can help you brainstorm. That you know, building those relationships and, and just finding out directly uh, would would be the thing. But you know, it, Hong, it's really hard to answer in abstract. And but you know, the yeah, thing. You know, I should probably be more specific. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a it's a battery technology. So the, a lot of the consumers or the, a lot of potential customers would be larger companies and enterprises. Like you said it's, uh, it's not as easy to battery, kind of battery test technology. It out. Like yeah. a, like a laptop yeah. battery or like an electric vehicle or same um, thing. Yeah. So yes, uh, and consumers could be like Tesla or other electric vehicle manufacturers. Yeah. Um, but the technology can also scale down to smaller vehicles. Yeah, for that stuff, I think you probably just need to go find those companies and talk to them directly. I think it's hard to. 
it's hard to, to really mm -hmm. imagine what their problems are. And I think that g there's no there's no substitute for going and talking to people directly about what their problems are. Um, but that's going to be great. You know, we're you know Greylock. We're mostly a software investor. We're really you know entirely software investors. So batteries are probably not really our thing. But but the world needs better batteries for sure. So it'd, it'd be good to get your get your company out in the market as quick as you can. Awesome. Thanks, Song. Uh, All right, great. great great question. Um, let's go to uh, let's see. We got uh, an email. So. Um, this is from Eric. How many startup pitches do you receive every day, and how many of those do you respond to? So this is always tough, right? I mean, you guys get bombarded with yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff, and I know you try to get back to as many as you can, but yeah. g give us some like orders of magnitude. Uh, I don't know. So I mean, I think I see. I probably take about between three and four hundred meetings with new companies a year. So and of the you know, and I've probably done. I've probably done two or three full-on institutional investments in a year, so it's about one percent hit rate, give or take. Okay. Um, you know, in a, in a, it, the weeks really vary, so um, you know, unsolicited pitches are tough, uh, and I think most people will tell you that they've they've funded very, very, very few, if not if if not zero, unsolicited pitches that didn't come in through a referral. And, you know, like we talked about earlier. The network is so robust now, and it's there's so many people starting companies, and so many people with connections, and so many people through social media, that you really should be able to find some connection through LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or something to at least get a warm intro. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I think that I'm pretty characteristic that I pay a lot more attention to warm intros than I do to cold intros, to cold, to cold pitches. Um, you know, but I don't, I don't know exactly. But I do take, you know, I saw four or five different companies today. Wow, um, just like people who had warm intro and yeah, and, uh, yeah. Let's see, one was intro from another, an instructor from another VC I worked with before. Uh, one was somebody uh, who's working on a seed round who we went and found. Um, one was uh, somebody who's working on a new web technology that came through an angel investor that we work with. Um, you know, it's it, it's really all over the map. But it's the powers of introductions. I think can't be. I, I can't stress enough that warm intros are always the best. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they, they just rise to the top, um, as, well, assuming it's somebody that you like and respect, uh, <laughs> which, you know, may, like, not, may not always be the case. I like all sources of, of intros. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, I, th I think, uh, oh, we had, we had another caller, but I think he dropped off. So um, uh, let's see. Here's another email from Michael. Um, what assistance do senior marketers in VCs like Elisa, Eli, I don't know how you say Elisa, it. Elisa, yeah. yeah. Elisa at Greylock provide to entrepreneurs? So this was a longer question uh, that came in and uh, it was like, do they actually help the companies and or are they sure. just, you know, marketing Greylock? So uh, Yeah, I think it depends. I think it depends on the day. You know, I think there's a, you know, people talk about whether venture capitalists should offer services or just be investors and on the boards. For, for us at Greylock, we have a couple of things that we focus on. One is a recruiting that we, we have a very, very robust um, team around because we believe that you know how you staff is everything, how you put yep. people in senior roles, how you put people in engineering and design roles. Uh, for marketing, <coughs> Elisa uh, Schreiber joined us in uh, January as our VP of marketing, vice president of marketing, and she used to run marketing at Hulu, so a consumer uh, company you know, down, in, down in Los Angeles. Yeah. And for, for Elisa, you know, what she's doing is trying to help us tell our stories a little bit at Greylock. Um, about the kinds of companies that we invest in and why, but she also helps and interacts with with virtually every startup we we invest in when wow. they when they need help. I think most startups, as you get as you get uh, ramped and running, you develop your own ability to tell your story, and it's sort of that's the job of the CEO and the job of the company is to tell your story again and again. Um, but Elisa can help give you know help with guidance or an introduction at the right time, and she's been super valuable to a few of the companies that I've been involved with. So. So I think it's still evolving. There's a, a lot of heavy, if you look at our website, you can tell there's a lot of heavy lift, just marketing Greylock at the moment, uh, and fixing <laughs> uh, some, uh, some of our work. But uh, yeah, but she's, uh, she helps our startups all the time. All right. So um, next we have a call. Um, this is uh, one, of, one of our regulars, Larry from Yuba City. So um, I don't know if Larry's ever called before. Larry, are you with us? I am, Joe, can you hear me okay? Yeah, welcome. Nice to hear your voice. Thanks. Oh well, thanks for doing a great job. You know, a great job with this show. Um, you have great guests. Um, I'm sure that there are many startups that are so busy they can't actually catch your show live. So we're fortunate that we can usually take some time away to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a question for John. Okay. It, it, 
And, and I was wondering, when you look at a company, how do you rank the importance of the problem or opportunity that the startup is solving relative to the relationship that you might have with the founder or with what one of your partners might have with the founder um, relative to the team that they've assembled to solve the problem? Um, right. So how do, we, how do we look at the problem that you're solving versus, the, uh, versus the, the relationship with the founders? I would say there are different, there are different types of investments you make. Sometimes there are people who are just so obviously unbelievable and smart. You say, here's an investment, go crazy. Like, do what you will and be good. But solely based on the person, not, not the even... The person and their background. Okay. And in particular for us, what we've noticed is that um, when there are certain founders who come back, who kind of tilt at the same problem multiple times in their career. You look at somebody like Ev Williams, who's been around publishing three times now, blogger, Twitter and now in our medium, easy for us to get excited about backing him. Yeah. Um, you know, guys like Jason Kylar uh, uh, doing Vessel now after he did Hulu. Um, so there's sometimes when you just say, look, that person is so obviously talented, so obviously motivated, we're, we, we just want to be in business and we just want to help. Um, there are other times when you, uh, and, and then you sort of trust that their instincts will steer them to important problems in big markets. Yeah. Then there are other times you look at the problem and say, man, this is, a, this is a brutal problem to solve. If we could solve this problem, things would be, what, it could be good. I would say that for us uh, specifically, we think less about the problem and more about the product. Like the, how you answer what the problem is uh, matters I mean, more than just saying, well, you know, I've looked at uh, analyst reports and there's this big gap in the market and here's what McKinsey says and here's what Deloitte says. And so for us, it's, it's having a sense of what the world should look like not just the sense of how the world is broken and not just a sense of the opportunity. So, yeah. you know, I think what you find for us is that, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes into, the, into any presentation, we say, whether it's consumer or enterprise, we say, hey, can we just see the product? Let's talk about it. Hmm. And then hearing people talk about the product and what they've built and how they're building it and uh, giving, gives insight into how they think about it, how they empathize with their with their users and their customers, and how they think about the the big market space. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say it's a, it's a, always a combination of things. You want people working on big problems, but you also want them kind of seeing how they're going to take steps to get go from here, where you're kind of just starting here to here to here to here, and tack so you can actually attack the big thing and get the big change you want. But you know, it's a, it's a it's a mix of things, honestly. The you did say. Relation, founder with a relationship with the founder, but then you said in the team they've assembled. I will say, you know, the, te the, the team you're able to assemble, that's huge. Um, recruiting is the, the one of the main, main jobs of a CEO. Yep. And the ability to get unnaturally talented people, people who really shouldn't take jobs at that level, to but join to join you, that's huge. Yeah. And being, will willing to f being able to get people to follow you, that's a huge signal. Yep. All right, awesome. Thanks, Larry. Great question. Um, Let's uh, let's do one more here before we uh, we go to the um, to the sponsor stuff. Um, this one is an email from Marty. I am looking for a technical co-founder for my startup. What's the best way to find one? So again, related to recruiting, right, yep. and building a team. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah, co-founders are tricky. You know, I was very lucky when I started my company that uh, I started with two guys that I had worked with and known for a long time, three guys really, that I'd known for a long time. And it was just an emergent process for us where um, the time kind of came, we all quit our jobs and started a company. And I, I don't know if it was like that for you. Uh, uh, sometimes like that, other times, you know, out trying to find Oh know, right, you've done, you've done a few things, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, you've been done this a few, number of times. Yeah. I, I would say it's just hard. I think that the main thing is you gotta kiss a lot of frogs. Um, I think that uh, as much as anything, it's how you fit together and your chemistry. I think that it's an affinity for a problem. Like maybe you're super psyched about Bitcoin or super psyched about crypto or super psyched about solving problems in healthcare. Yep. And I think you know you just gotta show you gotta show up and talk to people and then and then uh, and just not get discouraged. Uh, you know, spend a lot of time at meetups, spend a lot of time blogging, spend a lot, you know. And then I think if you and spend a lot of time reading. So I think if you see people blogging and tweeting about stuff you're interested in, reach out. But uh, cold calling, 
for other founders, a lot of times you say, hey, I saw this thing you wrote. I know you work at Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn now, but I saw this thing you wrote and it really spoke to me. Would you be up for a cup of coffee? That's a, that'd be a huge thing too. Yeah. But it, it takes some time, you have to be patient. Well, and I, and I think a lot of people are a little shy about that sort of thing and, and uh, would never think to like reach out to some person and say, hey, um, do you want to get together for that? But y you can find some amazing people and what, what I found over the years is, um, it, it may not be right for them at that moment in time, but maybe somewhere down the road, there's sure. a different opportunity, right? Um, so I, I think that's a big deal. But um, you know, Marty, I, I think it's I think it's a hard problem um, to just you know have a business idea, and, and certainly it's it's unlikely you'd get it funded at that point um, yeah. until you have a technical co-founder and you've actually even started building something, um, if not launched, uh, you know, at least a prototype. So. Um, so good luck. Um, there's a, there's also there's a site called uh, Founder Dating. I don't yep, know if you have course. any experience with that, but um, uh, a couple of friends are, are involved in that, and um, you might might check that out as well. So uh, hope hope that helps you out. Um, so I'd like to take a minute now to thank our sponsors. So relax, you know, sure. have a drink, uh, do whatever you need to do. Um, so uh, this show would not be possible without the amazing support we see we receive from our two sponsors, UStream and Auric. Um, let's start with Ustream. Uh, we've been working th with them since uh, we started the show and uh, initially reached out to their CEO, uh, Brad Hunstable, and then ultimately ended up working with um, a number of the people on the team there, especially Alden and Warren, and uh, you know, just had, had great support throughout, um, especially we took the show on the road this summer and over to Europe and um, making sure that we were able to remotely broadcast from, from London and Paris, uh, you know, that, w that was a little bit of a challenge and they definitely helped us through um, those, those issues as well. So if you're thinking about uh, streaming, you know, a meeting or doing some sort of uh, live webcast or whatever it might be, you definitely want to check out Ustream. You can go to their website and learn more. It's ustream.tv. Um, I'd also like to thank Mitch Zukli and the team over at Auric. Uh, Mitch and I have known each other for a long time and have worked together on multiple companies. Um, I, always, I always tell uh, founders who I'm meeting and, and uh, working with, you know, your, your lawyer is one of your most important advisors. Um, not only do they take care of the, the blocking and tackling on the legal side, but also just in terms of advice on things like uh, acquisitions or hiring or whatever it might be, they've seen so many more of these situations than you might have seen and, and can really help talk you through some of the pros and cons of whatever issue you might be facing. So um, make sure you find somebody good. Uh, Auric is, is the best and uh, you can go find out more. Uh, they're at auric.com and hopefully uh, they'll help you out as well as they've helped me out over the years. So with that, we're going to switch over to a segment we like to call Ask the Lawyer. And um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Mitch Zuckley, who's the uh, chairman and CEO of Oric, with us every week. Uh, we, we like to cover one legal topic every week and see if um, you know, we can help people out with something that they might see on the legal front. So um, today, uh, we're going to talk about acquisitions with Mitch. Mitch, are you with us? Hey Joe, great to talk with you. Hey, great, great to have you again. And um, you know, I thought I thought today um, acquisitions would be a great topic. Uh, you know, most startups, if they have an exit at all, um, most likely that exit will end up being an acquisition of some sort uh, versus going public. And a lot of times, the founders um, haven't been through an acquisition before. You know, if they're just out of school or um, maybe have worked at Google for a while and then started a company. So, um, you know, I, I think this is where a lawyer can be extremely valuable. And, and Mitch, maybe uh, today you can start us off with some thoughts about, you know, what, what are the critical things that a founder needs to understand about acquisitions? Uh, you bet, Joe. And obviously, you know, John's got a lot of experience with acquisitions as to you and, um, there's a lot of business issues to, to wrestle through as well, but let me let me start with three legal issues that jump out at the forefront uh, that I think people need to pay attention to. The first is, if you look at where people often get in disputes, most often it's around uh, an earnout. Some deals are structured with the idea that 
you know, there's uh, there's an escrow. Most almost all deals have a provision where a certain bucket of money called an escrow is set aside to make sure that reps and warranties are true and correct. But there's a separate type of a of a, of a structure called an earnout where additional consideration goes to the company if certain milestones are met after the deal. Far and away, the the most substantial fights that you have in uh, in merger context is about whether an earnout should have been earned or not. And the reason, of course, is once you sold your company, you're not always in control of it. And those earnouts often depend on business objectives being met. So that is just an area of stunning uh, 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 litigiousness. So avoiding earnouts if you can is a is a really good idea. Second issue from a legal perspective to really pay attention to is is whether or not your liability is capped. That matters to founders. It certainly matters to investors and venture folks. And um, there's uh, the usual is to say that the, the proceeds of the deal are your proceeds, except in the case of fraud, uh, and except to the extent that there's an escrow out there. But but sometimes that's not the case. And in fact, you can you can be exposed sometimes in an unlimited fashion if a rep goes wrong. It's critically important that that not happen. It would be really hard for a venture fund to distribute proceeds if that was set up in, in uh, to its limited if that was set up improperly. And it's very hard for a founder to feel comfortable knowing that the, whatever money they've earned through that deal is, is one that they they can spend unless that's done properly. The third issue that I'd pay great attention to is the retention package of your team. John, you were just talking about how important recruiting is to an evaluation from John's perspective of how good a leader somebody is. And obviously, you know, entrepreneurs look work incredibly hard to assemble a good team. The retention of that team is a, a, another really critical point. Uh, and and how, that, how that's treated, what percent of the total acquisition goes to that, how long the duration of how people have to how long people have to stay in order to to get that retention package is is a is a, I think the third most thorny of the legal issues, um, and then there's of course there's an awful lot of, of complicated tax issues around that too you got to pay attention to, but those are the big three and we could spend a long time talking about each of those I- issues individually but at a high level those are the three the three biggest legal issues and I you know if you guys have time I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, you guys have done a lot of, of acquisitions, and I'd love to hear your view on it as well. Yeah. So, so John, you know, what, what do you think? What have What have you seen uh, both in the yeah. companies you've uh, been been involved with, as sure. well as some of the investments? Yeah. Well, I think I think those are those are good issues to bring up, and I think that one thing I guess the older the the older I get and the longer I do this, the more I think about what uh, what what I call what alignment. Yep. And the more I think about how do we how do we structure things so they're both going at the same goal in the same way. And I think that, you know, what Mitch is talking about on structuring earnouts and, you know, um, retention packages are sort of the merit or sort of the, the flip side of earnouts, which is sort of forward looking package, you know, ways to keep people and make sure you get value out of the acquisition over time. And I, I would say that what you're really trying to do is figure acquisitions happen because a large company, a small company want to work together for some for some period of time to get to some outcome. So I think that just thinking about alignment is the big thing. So I think that it's easy to to say, well, those guys are on that side of the table and we're on this side of the table and we're going to take as much as we can off the table. What you're really trying to figure out is how on day zero and how on day 30 and how on day 365 do we set it up so that we're all try- feeling like we're running at the same thing, and we're all feeling like we're doing the same thing, and not feeling like we're fighting? Yeah. And so I think that that's why that's why you have earnouts at some level because the the larger company is trying to force alignment by you caring about some sort of business business metric. And so I think that a lot of times what it's all about is just trying to remember that there are certainly financial and legal aspects to cover, but more philosophically you're trying to figure out how to work together over the long term. And you, you're kind of doing all this deal stuff, but you know, once the deal closes, you're, you're on the team. Yep. And you can either be fired up and aligned with, the, with your new company, or you can be you know, uh, out to make sure you extract the maximum, maximum payments and tolls. And I think so it's, it's, it's always probably worth just for both sides, generally, to take a deep breath, remember why you're doing it, and 
try to think about it over the long term in the medium term as opposed to just the just the transaction date yeah and and sometimes that's hard right because it's always uh, it's always hard yeah you, you know you're running out of money and um, you know you're trying to get a return for your investors or whatever it might be but um, I, I think I think those um, the the situations where the acquisition works out is when they've spent a ton of time working through those yeah. issues and uh, and and yes, there are legal mechanisms to kind of enforce that or help yeah. help to enforce it. But uh, but you know the other thing I'd say is that life is long, and I think people are losing sight of this a little bit. So you know I've worked with you in probably half a dozen different contexts over the last twenty years. I worked with Mitch in a bunch of different contexts. I was at a board meeting for the first time where. It was the first time I'd gone to this board meeting, but every person in the room I had known or worked with over the past 20 years. And so I think that people get a little worked up about being in this particular thing, you know, this particular transaction or that particular deal. And I think that it's worth remembering, like we're all in this over a long period of time and things will come back. Yep. And so if you work hard and get out of alignment or get yours right now, people will remember that it'll, it'll come back around sooner or later. So, I mean, life is long. Absolutely. So, Mitch, any uh, any closing thoughts you'd like to add? No, other than to say, I think that's totally sage advice, and uh, it is it's absolutely right that uh, one transaction does not make a career, and one uh, one deal or one financing certainly doesn't either. And uh, taking a long a long term view, as as you and John just advocated, is is exactly right. Although if you can get the right one, maybe it does make a career. <laughs> so keep, keep, keep looking. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, th thanks, Mitch. Uh, it's it's great to have you with us again, and um, uh, we'll uh, talk to you again next week. All right. See you guys. Have talk a good rest of the show. All thanks, right. Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. That is Mitch Zukli from Oric, uh, who uh, had some great great advice for us. Um, once again, if you uh, want to reach us with a question, you can call us 1-844-4-FOUNDER. You can email help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline. You know, we, we could spend the entire show just in three shows probably talking about those issues. Yeah. Um, the, no, the other nothing's thing, more fun than legal advice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. I, I'm in more of the acquisition side of things. I'm just and, teasing. Uh, you know, the, the thing that... Um, uh, you know, stands out for me is um, I think one of the mistakes I've made over the years and seen others make is is not really um, uh, expecting that you know good will triumph and not necessarily you know getting every last detail down in writing. And if it's not down in writing, it's probably not happening. So um, uh, so you know you want to trust and you yeah. want to go into it you know eyes wide open and hope that all's going to work out. But uh, sometimes it doesn't. I think that's right. I think it depends on the depends on the actor, but I think that's right. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's let's get back to some questions. Uh, we have a tweet here from support women startups. So, um, and it's kind of in shorthand. Uh, so, uh, it's advice you have for women startups not venture capital savvy but have divergent potentially high growth business models. So. Uh, you know, the advice I have for women startups is the advice I have for all startups, which is make things people give a damn about and, uh, and be relentless about it. Um, you know, I've been lucky to work with some amazing uh, women entrepreneurs in my career. You know, Mariah Finley, who runs Citrus Lane, she just, we just sold that company to yeah. Care.com uh, last week, week before. Uh, Jennifer Palka, you know, Mitchell Baker, who runs, uh, you know, Mozilla, or uh, who started Mozilla. Um, you know, it's the same as, same as it always is, which is just startups are hard. And so you got to make pe things that people care about and you got to have a big vision and just keep going. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question other than, than be good at what you do, you know? Yep. And, and well, I think, I think her point was, you know, they haven't maybe raised venture capital before, but, um, you know, I, I think especially now there's a lot of, um, visibility in the topic of women in Silicon yeah. Valley and, yeah. and sexism and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, most VCs right now um, are, are particularly sensitive in, in, you know, identifying ways that they can be more helpful to women founders in general. Yep. Um, I, you know, I, I've, at least in my career, I found um, most investors and startup people to be completely color, you know, sex, uh, blind to any, any issue around that. I'm sure that's not the case for a lot of people, and it's not to say that um, 
uh, issues don't come up over time, whether it's sexual harassment or discrimination or otherwise. But um, I don't know. What, what, have, what have you seen? Uh, yeah, I think that's, the, I think that's the, the conventional wisdom, which is like, look, nobody, like very few people are really bad actors. There, there, are, there are some that are like legitimately bad actors, but most of us aren't doing anything wrong. And, and I think that's probably not enough. Um, so I'd say that the, I think that the, you know, we talked about more, getting warm intros, for example. And yeah. the, the truth is that there are more men as part of networks and get to warm intros and there are women. So there's, uh, you know, uh, Mitch Kapor, who founded my first company and his wife, Frida uh, Kapor Klein, they do a lot of work on what they call implicit or hidden bias. And what that is is just the system's not neutral. The system's clearly, clearly unweighted for men and against women and yeah. for, for uh, Caucasians against other races because of the way the networks have been built. And so I think, you know, it's, uh, I think we have a lot of work to do, I think is all I can say. Uh, I think we haven't done well enough uh, I haven't done well enough. I do the best that I can. Um, I think that there's more work that we need to do to highlight successes of women. Uh, you know, Megan Smith at Google has been doing a really good job lately about highlighting the women, women-led breakthroughs in computer science and technology breakthroughs and women entrepreneurs lately. We need to do more of that. I think that it's it's been good and healthy for. Th there's this sort of uh, sort of self. Uh, um, self-disclosure thing that's happening where VMware and Facebook and, 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 and Google and our, is started to share, at least share the data about mm. employees. That's a good start, but it's not, it's not enough. So, you know, I don't have any good answers, but I would say that just, just not doing harm is probably not, not the standard we should be holding ourselves to. Awesome. Well, I, I hope, uh, hope that's helpful. Um, Let's go to uh, Jay, who has an email. Um, Lots of startups are in continuous fundraising mode where they'll do multiple convertible notes in a short span of time. We're seeing this, you know, over the course of a year, they might do three or, yeah. or more um, convertible notes at different um, price points. So um, what's your position on this? Does it hurt our chances of raising a real A or B round? I don't think it hurts. I don't think it, I mean, it's not probably helpful to spend a lot of time talking to investors. I think that that's a, it's um, often a distracting thing. And, and you start to think that discussions with investors are the core part of the work as opposed to building products people care about. Yep. Um, I do think that mostly for A's and B's now, what you're really looking for is teams that have built products that seem to be working in the market, whether their enterprises are buying them, whether consumers are adopting them. And I think that most, I think that the, the the best investors will look and say, on the facts, this is working or this isn't working, yeah. and and then not worry too much about how the company got capitalized over the previous twelve months. I mean, there there are certain concerns about ownership and making sure the management team has enough and that the investor can own enough coming in. But I don't think it has, I don't think it is positive or negative. Just like people sometimes ask me about. Um, you know whether going through an incubator is positive or negative, and you know what I answer is I, I don't really care. Depends, like right? just, yeah, it just kind of depends on what you've built yeah. and whether it's any good or not, and yeah. then and then and whether we can help. I I am um, I found that uh, sometimes it can can be a distraction, as you said. For sure. And they end up just chasing, you know, more money. And I look, I've been in that chair where the money's dwindling down, yep. and you're like, you know, look, if we don't get more money in three months, we're dead. For sure. Um, what, what I what I've found is especially if um, money comes chasing you that if you have to do if it's six months later and you have to do a new note you know at a slightly different price um, take the money you yeah. know if it's a good yeah. investor I obviously right. um, but uh, don't spend all your time if you, if you spend all your time uh, you know chasing money instead of recruiting and building product and the things you really need to be doing as a founder um, you're probably going to end up failing anyway so. Um, I would say complexity too is the enemy generally. So I think simplicity is always to be strived for. And so I think there, sometimes you're trying to optimize the last penny or pricing on a round. You say, well, this guy got it, you know, two weeks ago, so the price should be like seven percent higher now. Yeah. And in general, that just adds complexity and in in a way that's probably not additive to the company overall. Yep. Totally agree. Um, all right, so let's see. We have another one, uh, an email from Pascal. Um, how did a company like Instagram outperform a company like Color when Color had all the money and top talent like DJ Patil? So uh, <laughs> uh, that's a little bit of a loaded question, but. Um, well, DJ is a good friend of mine. They also had talent like Peter Pham, who runs Science now in LA, and Bill Wynn, who had done many startups. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, money's not the thing mostly. Like building a product uh, that people care about is often just not correlated with money. Um, you know, uh, 
what can I tell you? Like sometimes money's a distraction. Sometimes it means you build out. I think being focused and having constraints is a is a is a pretty good thing. So, you know, Instagram. You know, they they were wandering around for a little while for the app called Bourbon. That's right. Which, that was that was their first product, right? Yeah, which social no, network. Nobody kind of. really much wanted this like social network for sharing stuff and with people, and it was pretty vague. But then they noticed that people were sharing pictures, and so Kevin and Mike said, "Well, maybe we should just just do that. Maybe we should listen to our users." And so that's that's what Instagram came came from, and then they just really they really worked hard to reduce all the areas of friction around what the, the access they cared about, which is, you know, how fast can people share things and get them out to their networks. And so, you know, they were just really maniacal. They were, you know, working from some constraint. Um, do, you, do you know what their cash situation was when they made that decision? I don't think they had raised a lot of money at that point, I think right? they hadn't raised a lot. So that was before they raised from Matt at Benchmark, but after they raised from Steve uh, Anderson at Baseline. Okay. And so they probably had a million dollars or something. I, I don't know exactly. Um, you know, Color raised, I think their raise was $41 million from Sequoia and others. And, you know, the truth is... Before they had anything, right? Before they had anything, yeah. But, but you're, you're the... the, the Questioner is exactly right. Like DJ is a profoundly talented guy. Bill and uh, Peter are talented. Sometimes all star teams work. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes big bang launches work. Sometimes they don't. If it were me launching a product now, I wouldn't announce a big funding. I wouldn't announce a big product launch. I would just go out and build products that people care about, and then let the let let the product speak for itself. Let distribution take care of itself. Yeah, great advice. I, I think sometimes too much money can really cause all sorts of issues. Right? Yeah. You're worrying about what kind of finishes should we get on the desks? And That's you know, right. it's like, desks desk don't matter. Like, yeah. the product matters. You so. know, it is worth mentioning, though, that the color's vision wasn't wrong. So, you know, with Snapchat stories are very close to color vision, color's vision now. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, it was just, it just wasn't the right time. It was a little too early. They're trying to do a few too many things all at once. And few, the interface was a little too minimal, like not, you know, it, Things things have a way of coming back around, but their their idea wasn't wrong. Yep, and and they're all you know they're all good guys. So um, that's that's uh, it reminds me a little bit of the Yankees, like that you know like very high uh, priced uh, thing, but you know they don't win the win World Series every year, right? So um, sometimes small ball works. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. But, but DJ is VP of product at Relate IQ, which just got sold to to Salesforce for a sky high price. So. Yeah, yeah. So he did fine. All right, you're just covering your ass with him to make sure he's not pissed <laughs> off at you. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Here's an email from Steven. Um, when Greylock makes an investment, does the decision have to be unanimous? What if one, uh, one or more partners disagree? Oh, so we... Um you talked about um, yeah. uh, when you did Tumblr, right? That was, you didn't even, the yeah. rest of the partnership didn't even know. So Well, they, they knew. We, we worked it through. It's not like I wrote a check and like, oh, my God, I don't want to tell my partners. But the, um, yeah, so our data shows, pr so uh, we don't vote. Uh, we The way we work is we have a sponsoring partner who comes in and advocates for a, uh, for an investment, and uh, we talk about it, and we kind of figure out what makes sense. Um, we get a little nervous when there's too much consensus. Our, our historically, you know, if everybody hates it or everybody loves it, uh, that said, to, uh, the the data has played out for us that it wasn't our best investments. Hmm. Um, our best investments have been ones that have been fairly contentious. Like, not everybody loved Instagram when, when we did that investment. Um, you know, Airbnb is a great example of a, a company that Reed invested in, which. Uh, you know, not everybody loved the idea of like this idea of like renting your couch out to some guy. Yeah, um, seems a little crazy, or it did when they made the investment. Yeah. And Reed was Reed had conviction and he believed in it, and he made the case, and he and he, he won the day. And the, you know, the, the one of the best examples of all time though is Facebook, and uh, you know David David Z invest in Facebook. I think in two thousand five or two thousand six, so very early at a at a valuation that was insane. It was something like four or five hundred million dollars at the time. And I think most everybody in Silicon Valley thought he had absolutely lost his mind. Yeah, yeah, and, th and that was crazy. That was a large amount of money back then, right? And it was like, not very long. Yeah, back when back when half a billion dollars was a lot of yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, not like today. Yeah. Um, and uh, but that was not very long after Jim Breyer had done it at about a hundred million. And so people thought David had lost his mind, and there was internal like discussion about whether it was a good idea or not. Our, our, what we what, what we believe is that the partners of the firm develop internal conviction and partnership with entrepreneurs, and 
what, what Reed is fond of saying, like the, what you want to be is contrarian and right. Like <laughs> contrarian and wrong sucks. Yeah. Like, and, but if you're not contrarian, it doesn't matter. Because if you think what everybody else thinks, there's no opportunity to make money or change the world. So contrarian and right is what you want. And so we don't look for unanimity in the partnership ever really. Sounds good. Steven, hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, oh, and in fact, there was a Newsweek piece about um, an investment we did recently called Sprig. Um, it's, uh, you know, push a button and get your food delivered in 10 minutes or something. And it's a guy named Gagan Biryani, uh, who's the CEO. And he was, it was a funny experience because he came in and pitched. And during his pitch, uh, our two most senior partners, Neil Bushri, who's the CEO of Workday, and uh, David Z. Uh, uh, who's done a lot of consumer investing, they started arguing about the merits of what Goggin was saying while Goggin was running his pitch. And so was David and Anil kind of going back and forth. And um, there's a Newsweek cover story of, about us and, and about that, that experience. But it's very typical. We argue all the time. Yep. And that's where the interesting, the interesting edges are the places you're arguing about, not, not where you're agreeing. Well, the, the best thing when you're a CEO, and I've been in that situation where like a couple partners are going back and forth is, you just let them go, and um, it's really awesome when like they basically take your side and make the case for you, and they're they're repeating things that maybe they haven't even heard from you yet, yeah. and uh, so uh, it's a so way worse case when nobody's saying anything. Yeah, it's yeah, way better exactly. when people are arguing about. What I, actually, saying. I actually had a situation once where I knew something to be true, and one of the um, investors was arguing the opposite. Yeah, and I, I had a choice to make right there of. How, how hard do I push on this? And um, luckily, the, the firm did some investigating and turned out she was completely wrong and, and uh, you know, ended up being, um, th that, was the, that was the deciding factor in making the investment or not. So uh, My two cents, or you should hold your ground on things that you know are true. I mean, things are matters of opinion. You sh I think you should try hard to listen and try hard to understand points of view because a lot of people who are around the table on these things have been around for a long time. But if something you know is true, and they're not listening to you, then you kind of don't want to be their partners anyway. Yeah, so. absolutely, um, absolutely. All right, so let's see, we've got time for a few more here. Um, this email is from Alex. After a startup like Tumblr or Instagram is acquired, do you still stay involved and help the founders? Great question. Um, yeah, it kind of depends. Um, you know, those two companies don't need a hell of a lot of help. Like they're both off to the races. Um, yep. You know, I talked to, in the months after the Tumblr acquisition, I talked to David um, a few times, uh, you know. Just to check in and see yeah. how it's going. And yeah, and he was recruiting he was recruiting for various roles, and we talked about some people for those, those roles. Um, Kevin got acquired by, Insta uh, by Facebook, and, you know, he was kind of sucked into the board for a little while. And, um, you know, I see Kevin every quarter or two now. Um, we, work, we work together on other projects, but he had, they, neither one of those guys needs a lot of help. Yep. So, so you, it sounds like you kind of fade out after the acquisitions made. As yeah, but sense. both, you know, I, I find ways to work with both of them, and that's that's the plan. Yeah, makes sense. Um, all right, let's see. Here's one uh, from Antonio. I'm a successful entrepreneur interested in moving to the VC side. What's the best way to do this? <laughs> well, there's probably not only one way to do it, but uh, I mean, maybe share your story of how it happened or other yeah. thoughts on uh, how, how the, that comes about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you a few things. I would say that venture is a super idiosyncratic industry. So, um, and maybe calling it an industry is a little too kind. It's a, it's a weird, uh, you know, conglomeration of things. Um, I tried to do VC my first time in 2005, and I kind of underestimated the, how important fit was. And I looked around to try to find a good fit for a firm and I, I couldn't really find one and thank God because that's what led me to, to join Mozilla when it was 12 people hmm. where I would eventually become the CEO and, and, and grow up to about you know, nearly half a billion users. And so that was the luckiest failure. Well, I've had a bunch of failures in my life. They're all, you know, that was a pretty lucky one because um, it really led to good uh, professional growth for me and a, and a really good opportunity. Um, this, this last time around, it took me probably a year to really find the right place. Um, I had a very small aperture. Like that's one of the things is like you should go in with knowing what your criteria are, knowing the people in the firm. And you know, with Greylock, I had known Reed. I've known Reed and worked with Reed for ten or fifteen years now on a variety of things, including Mozilla. Um, I'd known and respected Anil and David and James. And um, it, even then, it took us the better part of a year to to figure out whether it was a fit or not. Um, so I think one thing is be very very patient. One is to get to know people and kind of understand that most 
firms aren't really recruiting partners. Uh, it's a little bit like a dentist's office. Like you, you've got four or five dentists, and they're not saying they're not running around all day saying, "Man, if we only had one more dentist in the office, that'd right. be great." Right. Um, and so uh, you really have to find a place to, to, to fit and timing, and there's a whole bunch of things that have to come together. So being a little bit patient, but being f you know, focused on the relationships and the people you know and building building value on both sides. There's not a real generic, there's not a real uh, answer, a one size fits all answer for this. It's, uh, as, as you know, it's, a, it's just a quirky, quirky process. Yep. Well, Antonio, hopefully that's helpful and uh, gives you some ideas there. Um, we have an email from Victor. Why are VCs so bad at responding to startups even after they say they will? Yes. So, uh, you know, this, this comes up a lot. Like, I, I reached out and I never heard back. Maybe it goes back to the warm intro, you know, piece well, from earlier. But um, Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's probably talking about the people who don't ever respond to your first email. I think, I think he's responding to um, or he's reacting to people who take meetings and then say, okay, we'll get back to you by Tuesday, and then don't. Okay. And uh, that's a pet peeve of mine, too. I think that um, most investors are not very good at this. Um, I will say that probably... It probably took me 10 months before I had to write my my confessional blog post about why I was so terrible at oh, it one week. You wrote something about this? I, th I think everyone does. Oh, okay. Because yeah, it's, I think it's like a rite of passage for yeah. VCs. <laughs> right. So I Here's think you know. Why I suck at getting back to people. Well, and, and I try. I try really hard to be as good as I can. I think that what the the and um and I, I take it really seriously. And I'm I'm hard on myself when I don't. And then I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and say, Oh my God, I didn't send mail back to. Steve or Jim or whatever, and then I'll get up and I'll, I'll go do it. And that's why sometimes uh, entrepreneurs get notes from me at weird times of night. <laughs> um, but, but it's not perfect. And I think what I, what I underappreciated is that when you're an investor and you get involved in three or four or five or six companies, what that means is that and any, every company kind of goes at different, different cycles and different paces. And if one company goes through a financing or an acquisition or a crisis, then you can really focus on that. If two of your companies does that, okay, well, you can focus on those two. If like three of your companies all go through a crisis the same week and you're trying to, to maintain all the meetings you're seeing, well, you go into a hole. Yeah. And suddenly you're, you, suddenly you're in meetings with new pitch meetings, you know, 10 hours and then and then you need to be on the phone with the CEO working on acquisition for a couple hours and you know by the time you get all through all that stuff it's midnight and you've got your mailbox and you just can't find time so some, sometimes you go into a hole and so um, I think it, a lot of it has to do with timing a lot of it has to do with um, deliberateness uh, I'm late on at least three responses right now and I can I could I could list them off and he's gonna get back to you later today so don't, don't worry it's gonna I, bug um, him. it's gonna wake him up in the middle of the night it so. does it does bother me but I feel and I feel bad about it um, but I think that's what happens is you just get because you, because of the nature of the job you've got a bunch of different types of commitments all at the same time and sometimes they just collide yep makes sense all right, we've got about 60 seconds left. We'll, we'll squeeze in one more uh, from Gideon. When did you know that Instagram was going to be huge and what was the return on investment? So uh, you can disclose as much or as little about that as you'd like, but... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I try not to think, you know, I, I try to do the best I can and say, look, this is going to be an interesting, fun thing. For, for me, I saw Instagram and it, it was a compelling thing for lots and lots of people, so I thought it had a chance to be great. Um, when did you know, though? Like when? Well, I, I guess it was like a week later. So. Uh, well, I think Instagram is way bigger now than it was then. I think it could have been bigger now than the acquisition, but it was hard to tell that at the time. So um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Return on investment, we did fine. Like we, we put a little bit of money on on a Thursday. We got a lot. Of, I got a lot out <laughs> on a Sunday. So the, no the IRR was very high. I would guess. I, yeah. I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing. But I but I honestly wanted to work with Kevin, so it was disappointing on that on that vector. But. You know, cry myself to the bank, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, thanks for being such a great guest. Uh, you can uh, follow John on Twitter. His handle is John O'Lilly, and I'll let you figure that one out. Why the O? Is that your middle name? or Osborne. Yeah. I, I always wondered if it was like some Irish thing nope. or, you know, what was going on. Middle All right. name. So um, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Jeff Clavier who's the founder and managing partner of Soft Tech VC, uh, one of the more established seed VC firms in the Valley. Um, they've done over 150 investments in startups since 2004 when Jeff uh, started the firm. It'll be a great show. That's next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. 
Uh, thank you once again to our fantastic sponsors, Oric and Ustream. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. You can uh, email questions for Jeff in advance to help at founderline.com. You can also go to our website and subscribe to updates, uh, see more about upcoming guests, uh, and even subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching, everybody. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week.